Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our first major source for our unit three. And this unit is, of course, revenge and forgiveness. Now, the essay question that you're going to be answering at the end of this unit is, which is better, forgiveness or revenge? Or it can word it a different way is, which has more value, virtue or vengeance? That's just a harder way of saying it. Let's take it back to the easier way. And rather than saying, what has more value, virtue or vengeance? Just, which is better, forgiving or taking revenge on people who did you wrong? So, really, really great source to read for this, and I'm glad to do this as our first one, is the speech by Desmond Tutu. It's called Let South Africa Show the World How to Forgive. Um, this is a very, very, very important and famous speech uh, dealing with forgiveness and reconciliation. In fact, uh, it is known the world over um, and it is spoken about. In fact, we're going to be reading a couple of articles about forgiveness and revenge, and they're actually going to mention the speech in those articles because this speech is that important. Now, this speech um, is given by Desmond Tutu. Let me tell you a little bit about Desmond Tutu. Um, he was born um, in 1931 under the apartheid system in South Africa. Now, apartheid was a government-run segregation that was against black people in South Africa. And what it does is it, it limited their rights completely and it limited their economic opportunities. So in other words, they didn't have the same rights as other people, as white people, um, and they didn't have the same chances to succeed as white people. So in many cases, they were held back, legally held back, and they had no chance for making themselves better. That was called apartheid. Now, Desmond Tutu was born under the apartheid system in South Africa, and it assigned blacks to a second-class status with limited rights and economic, uh, and economic opportunity. Tutu gradually worked his way up through the hierarchy of the Anglican Church to become Archbishop of Cape Town. Um, from this position, he, ap he applied pressure on the South African government to end apartheid. Um, for his efforts, which eventually helped end apartheid in South Africa, he was actually awarded in 1984 the Nobel Peace Prize. And in 1995, he was appointed chair of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which investigated human rights violations during the apartheid era. From 2007 to 2013, Archbishop Tudor was the founding chair of the Elders, which was a group of independent global leaders working together for peace and human rights. Okay, so we are now about to hear our speech from Desmond Tutu. All right, now let me give you a little bit of background. This is in the beginning of the speech. Now let me also tell you about your homework. Uh, what I'm gonna ask you to do this evening is to please uh, uh, answer the quick right question, which is, which is better, forgiving people or revenge? And this is gonna come straight from your mind. Nothing from the, no details, no, um, no source material, it's just from your mind. What do you believe about forgiveness and revenge? Which is more important and why? Which is better and why? So that's what you're gonna answer for me. Now, today I'm gonna break Let South Africa Show the World How to Forgive into two readings. I will read one now, about half of it. In fact, I'm going to read specifically, this is uh, 18 paragraphs long. I'm going to read to the end of the ninth paragraph. So I'm gonna read half of the paragraphs. Um, and again, your only homework for tonight is to do that quick write paragraph. However, I'm also gonna to drop today your homework for tomorrow night, which is to give me three to five annotations from this entire speech dealing with that question of revenge, which is better, revenge or forgiveness. So you're gonna you're gonna take Quote, you're going to write down quotations, you're going to properly cite them, of course, and then you're going to annotate those quotes and you're going to point out how this speech or these examples can serve as um, quotes to help you when you answer the question yourself. Okay, so tomorrow night's homework will be to do three to five annotations on the entire speech, but I'm dropping it today because we're reading half the speech today. So you can start doing that homework today. Uh, maybe get a couple in. You might even get all three or five of your annotations in today. Although I will tell you to save some room for tomorrow because there are gonna be some really good quotes tomorrow as well. So let's go. Part one of Let South Africa Show the World How to Forgive. So the background. Apartheid was the system of legal racial segregation in South Africa put into place by the country's white government in 1948. Apartheid imposed repressive restrictions upon black, upon black South Africans, including denying them the right to vote. So these people lived in this country and they had to, you know, abide by the laws. But the problem was they were unable to vote for the lawmakers. So people were making laws about them, but they didn't have their own representation, right? So it's it's, it's it, an old way of saying taxation without representation. If you're unable to vote for the people who are making your laws, then that is not fair and it is not free. It gets worse. 
Uh, apartheid ended in 1994 after years of negotiations. In the following speech given at the University of Toronto in 2000, Desmond Tutu reflects on the injustices of apartheid and the work of Nelson Mandela, who fought against the system for 40 years. So at the end of reading this speech, we are going to know that Let South Africa Show the World How to Forgive, that Desmond Tutu clearly believes, Tutu, excuse me, clearly believed that forgiveness is the right way to go and that revenge actually makes things much worse. Forgiveness makes things much better. Revenge makes things much worse. Let's hear what he has to say. I'm going to read the first half of this. If you asked even the most sober students of South African affairs what they thought was going to happen to South Africa a few years ago, almost universally they predicted that the most ghastly catastrophe would befall us. That as sure as anything, we would be devastated by a comprehensive bloodbath. It did not happen. Instead, the world watched with amazement, indeed awe, at the long lines of South Africans of all races snaking their way to the polling booths on April 27th, 1994. Now, I will tell you that in 1994, I was a sophomore in college. Um, I wasn't very much into you know, politics or current events. I was you know, worried about college, about my classes and having fun. But I will never forget all of this happening. This was a huge deal in not just the news, but just in society itself, that this was happening in, in South Africa. Um, and it made news all around the world. And it was very important. This, this was a really big deal. Listen. And they thrilled as they witnessed Nelson Mandela being inaugurated as the first democratically elected president of South Africa on May 10th, 1994. So now what people were worried about was that once Nelson Mandela became president of the country, that he was going to come back and he was going to go after all of the people, all of the white people and the government officials who used apartheid to do unbelievably evil and awful things to black people. And I'm not just talking about, you know, denying them the right to vote or to get good jobs, which are awful and evil things, but I'm talking about much worse. And we're going to hear about some of them now. They murdered and they killed these people. They tortured and they destroyed their lives and families, all considered legal. So then years later, when Nelson Mandela took president, people were worried that he and South Africans, the, the black South Africans, were going to turn around and they were going to have, what he said before, a comprehensive bloodbath, that they were going to attack all these people, that they were going to go after them, that they were going to look for retribution and revenge against them. Quite the opposite happened. It was incredible what happened. Watch, please. Nearly everybody described what they were witnessing, a virtually bloodless, reasonably peaceful transition from injustice and oppression to freedom and democracy as a miracle. When the disaster did not overtake us, those that there were those who said, wait until a black-led government takes over. Then those blacks who have suffered so grievously in the past will engage in the most fearful orgy of revenge and retribution against the whites. So people said, just wait. If you allow a black person to become president of Africa or South Africa, he is going to lead a revolution of all the blacks against white people. See, but it was the exact opposite of that. Not only did he not lead uh, an orgy of revenge and retribution against white people, it's quite the opposite. He forgives, he forgives them. In fact, we're going to find out in a minute. He forgave his own jailer. Um, but more importantly, he brought everybody together because he understood that through forgiveness that you can have unity again. And after that, then you can have a country moving forward where everybody is free. Watch. Well, that prediction was not to be, was, I'm sorry. Well, that prediction too was not fulfilled. Instead, the world saw something quite unprecedented. They saw the process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, whose perpetrators, I'm sorry, when perpetrators of some of the most gruesome atrocities were given amnesty in exchange for a full disclosure of the facts of the offense. In other words, people were told if you came forward and you admitted what you did, then you would be given complete amnesty, which means you were set free. You were no punishment for it, but you had to admit what you did wrong in detail. And it had to, you had to say it and it had to be written down so everybody would know for, the, for eternity what evil things you did. Listen. Instead of revenge and retribution, this new nation chose to tread the difficult path of confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation. That's a really good quote right there. Um, and that is the end of paragraph number four. So instead of revenge and retribution, this new nation chose to tread the difficult path of confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation. We South Africans have not done too badly. 
It is sometimes said of newly democratic countries that their first elections too frequently end up being their last. Well, we have already had a fairly uneventful second general election and have witnessed the transition from a charismatic first democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela, to the more pragmatic pipe smoking Thabo McKicky, uh, Becky. The turmoil and instability that many feared would accompany these crucial events have not occurred. Why? Well, first, you have prayed for us, and if miracles had to happen anywhere, South Africa was prime South Africa. So they had a second free election, and Nelson Mandela was not the president anymore. They, they voted in a new guy, and still what they said was going to happen did not happen. Listen. And we have been richly blessed to have had at such a critical time in our history on Nelson Mandela. He was imprisoned for 27 years. Most expected that when he emerged, he would be riddled with a lust for retribution. So they took Nelson Mandela and they put him in jail for 27 years, not because he did anything wrong, but because he stood up and fought for the rights and freedom of all people. They locked him up for 27 years for saying everybody deserves freedom. Everybody deserves equality. And when he got out of prison, people were worried that he was going to go for a lust of retribution, that he was going to want to inflict pain on everybody who was going to want to jail. Heck, a lot of people would say, you put me in jail for 27 years for no reason. <laughs> I'm putting you in jail for 27 years for no reason. Quite the opposite. Watch what Nelson Mandela did. But the world had been amazed. Instead of spewing calls for revenge, he urged his own people to work for reconciliation and invited his former jailer to attend his presidential inauguration as a VIP guest. So rather than go to his former jailer and say, you, come on, you're going in jail where I was, he said, come, come to my inauguration as my guest. Listen to me say these things and be part of the peace and the reconciliation. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a wonderful quote. I'll read it again. But the world has been amazed. Instead of, 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 instead of spewing calls for revenge, he urged his own people to work for reconciliation and invited his former jailer to attend his presidential inauguration as a VIP guest. Imagine if he had done the opposite and he had called for that retribution. And if he had said to the people of South Africa, join me, let's go after these people. A lot of people would have joined him because he was the president. <coughs> but instead, <coughs> pardon me, he went the opposite route. And he went for forgiveness and, and, and reconciliation. And he shares that with his people. So his people shared that as well. Wait and listen. Wonderfully, Mr. Mandela has not been the only person committed to forgiveness and reconciliation. Less well-known people, in my theology, no one is ordinary. For each one of us is created in the image of God, are the real heroes <clears throat> and heroines of our struggle. Okay, so now we're going to hear the stories of different South Africans who came forward and told the stories of what happened to them, of how their family members were murdered or burned alive and how these people actually forgave and are forgiving those people who did that to their family members because they understood that through forgiveness could they move forward. That if they don't forgive these people, that that pain that they feel in their, in their, in their heart and in their body will always be there. Now, will the pain always be there if somebody kills somebody in your family? That pain's never going to go away. But the pain you feel as far as the anger and the revenge, that's something that you can work on and towards. And that's what Nelson Mandela is talking about. Listen, Let's hear some stories. There was a Mrs. Savage who was injured in a hand grenade attack by one of the libertarian movements. She was so badly injured that her children bathed her, clothed her, and fed her. She could not go through a security checkpoint at the airport because she still had shrapnel in her and all sorts of alarms would have been set off. She told us at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that she would like to meet her perpetrator. She, a white woman. And he almost certainly a black perpetrator in the spirit of forgiveness. Ah, so now we're finding out that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was not just about black people who were wronged by whites, but there were white people who were wronged by blacks at that time. And they're all forgiving each other because they wanted hatred to end. I always think of Romeo and Juliet, the story of Romeo and Juliet, and how because of that silly fight between the parents years and years ago, I mean, all they did was somebody talked badly about somebody else. They ended up hating each other, and they ended up having their kids hate each other to the point where the kids ended up killing each other and themselves just because of a problem that happened years ago. Imagine if they had just reconciled. I'm sorry. You saw, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. My bad. Whatever. And they just reconciled. You don't even necessarily have to forgive somebody, but you can reconcile. And that would mean to stop the forward motion of hatred against other people. And think about what happens in Romeo and Juliet. If the parents had just made up back in the day, Romeo and Juliet, 
would have been allowed to love each other. They would have had a great life and moved forward. But instead, they both lost their kids. Both the Montagues and the Capulets because of their own hatred. Listen to Miss Savage. She a white woman and he almost certainly a black perpetrator in the spirit of forgiveness. She would like to forgive him and then extraordinarily she added, and I hope he forgives me. Now that is almost mind boggling. Now what is she asking for forgiveness for? What did she do to him? Well, she was part of the white society that allowed this to happen. And if, you, if you're if you in a society and something evil is happening and you don't step up against it, that's called appeasement. That's kind of like what FDR was talking about when we read our Four Freedom speech. And he said, you know, if we don't step up and stop Hitler and the Nazis from taking over the world, taking over other countries, then he's just going to keep doing it. So we've got to step up and say it's bad. And that's what this woman right here, this white woman, she said, I apologize to you as well. Even though he named her for the rest of her life, she asked for his forgiveness. Listen, the daughter of one of our four African National Congress activists whom the police ambushed and then killed gruesomely. Listen again, the daughter of one of four African National Congress activists, uh, South African political party and black nationalist organization led by Nelson Mandela. So the daughter of one of these men whom the police ambushed and then killed gruesomely. The mutilated bodies were found in a burnt out car, came to tell their story, her story. She said the police were still harassing her mother and her children, even after their father had died. When she finished, I asked her whether she would be able to forgive those who had done this. We were meeting in a, in a city hall packed to the rafters. You could hear the proverbial pin drop. And she, and she replied, we would like to forgive. We just want to know whom to forgive. All right, that's where I'm going to stop today. That's the end of paragraph number nine. You should have, I mean, you don't have to remember tomorrow's homework is to give me the three to five annotations from this story, uh, from this speech. And I've already shown you two or three of them. You can use those in that. That's fine. Um, but make sure tomorrow after we read uh, paragraphs 10 through 18, if there's any better or more quotes that you can use, then you'll use those as well. Because remember, this is our major source for our unit three essay. Um, what is better, revenge or forgiveness? So this is going to be the first source you're going to be um giving examples from in the form of quotes in our essay in about two months time. Um, but again, tonight's homework is just to do that quick, right? Tomorrow night, you will do the annotations and you can pull from either today's reading or from tomorrow's reading. And then I'll check that the following day. Have a lovely day. We will finish this tomorrow.